Um, what I'd love to do is just tell you a little bit about the research that we're doing here at the Institute for Systems Biology. And I'd like to um, sort of hopefully inspire you a little bit about uh, systems biology and the power systems biology can bring to the scientific endeavor, uh, in, in particular biological research. And if there's one thing you can go away from this entire week with, if it's this thought, I think we'll, I will have uh, maybe inspired a little bit of thinking in you. For me, I read this from, I get a lot of quotes from Albert Claude. He's one of the, I think, one of the most brilliant scientists that ever lived. Um, he won the Nobel Prize with uh, a few others in 1974, I believe. Um, but this concept that cells are really this, uh, this, the unit of life in biology and it's the conglomeration of these cells that lead to the emergent property of life uh, for, of an organism like myself. The ability for me to convey thoughts, for you to um, incorporate them into your own thinking is really amazing to me. And um, really that is the, the principle of systems biology and the principle of emergent properties when we think about systems biology. So, um, as Claudia said, my name is John Aitchison. Um, that's who I am. What we're going to talk about today is really inspired by um, two visionaries, uh, Lee Hood and Alan Adarum. Lee Hood is the president here at, at ISB, uh, certainly a visionary for systems biology. Alan Adarum is, uh, was a co-founder for ISB. And a couple years ago, he moved over to Seattle Biomedical Research Institute across the street. And the goal here is to bring some of the advances in, and uh, innovations in systems biology to infectious disease research, to an application uh, that's near and dear to uh, Alan's heart, and that is in global uh, infectious disease, HIV, TB, and malaria. Um, I also want to acknowledge uh, some of the faculty here at ISB. These folks have been around for a long time and have influenced a lot of my thinking. And in particular, I'm going to, I stole a, a slide from Ilya, which I'll use a little bit later. But um, these, are, these are key personnel here at ISB. And I hope, hopefully you'll be able to interact with some of them while you're here. So if there was ever a system um, or a problem that is by its nature a systems problem, it's certainly biology. So when I say systems, so let me stop this actually. What you're seeing down here, this is a neutrophil, these are red blood cells, and this is a little bacterium. And this neutrophil is going to chase this bacterium around and try to eat it. He will shoulder away all of these red blood cells, ignoring them completely, until he's intent on his pursuit of that bacterium and then ultimately he'll engulf it. And while this is doing this, I want you to think about the emergent properties that have to happen. All of the interactions among all the proteins, the nucleic acids, all the lipid changes in the membranes, everything that has, to, the cytoskeleton, everything that has to happen for this thing to appear to think um, and then engulf this bacterium. So, a system is a collection of interacting parts with emergent behavior. So a simple one would be an arch. The strength of the arch is really uh, imposed or uh, conveyed by the interactions among these, these uh, components of the arch. And cells are dynamic networks of interacting components. Um, and there are many millions and millions of uh, interactions that lead to these emergent properties in cells. So you can think about metabolism, cellular behavior, immunity, and as I've mentioned, consciousness and life. What we do in systems biology is try to take a network view of molecular and hierarchical, hierarchical interactions within cells. So down on the right-hand side here is a molecular network. Each one of these little dots is a protein. Each one of these lines which is called an edge in this network diagram, is an interaction between a protein and another protein. 
is a snapshot of a human cell. Thousands and thousands of interactions among all of these proteins. And it's these interactions that the dynamics of these interactions, the changes in these interactions, that lead to the dynamics and changes in a biological system. So when you think about the, something as complex as, as this, I find it uh, uh, helpful to think about something like the air traffic network. So you think about this, this is a really quite a complex network. There are a few hubs. We call these hubs in these molecular, so that would be a hub. Houston is a hub. Um, and these are areas where the air traffic is very high. And if I think about this network and I want to travel, for example, from um, Seattle to Miami, there's no direct flight in this network, and so I'm going to have to travel through some uh, steps. Most likely, I'm going to travel through Denver or something like that. If I want to think about how to disrupt this network, if I want to completely destroy it, I might think about destroying Chicago or San Francisco. If I destroy Spokane, nothing much is going to happen, right? However, if I want to control it, if I want to control some element of the network, then perhaps Spokane would be a really good target. So we think about biology, we start thinking about how to control biology. We want to start thinking about those network elements like Spokane that when disrupted will have a specific effect but may have very little off-target effects. But if I want to kill a pathogen, if I want to knock out TB and rid it network out of the world, I might hit I might hit Chicago. Better yet, I might hit Chicago and Denver. Might not have such a good chance if I hit Chicago and Spokane. So those are the kind of thinking that we have to incorporate into our thinking about systems biology. So the promise of systems biology is that we can discover how information flows through these networks. We can predict how systems will behave. We can understand the emergent macroscopic properties of the system. So like that neutrophil chasing that bacterium or things like consciousness. Remember the macroscopic properties are all coming from the molecular interactions, the parts. And so, and we think about drugs, drugs all act at the molecular level. So we need to start thinking about how we can control network elements and control and understand biological complexity. That, I think, is the promise, the ultimate promise of systems biology. So what do we do? So obviously, if we want to understand parts and interactions, the first thing to do is to read, to see what those parts and interactions are. So we have tons of tools, and I think you'll, you might hear some of these tools uh, during the week. But we have lots of high-throughput molecular in interrogation tools here at ISB and, and in increasingly in other organizations as well, to quantify all the molecular constituents of a system and their interactions. We immediately try to extract and define dynamic network behavior, and then computationally and mathematically integrate all sorts of different data types. So this is where the mathematics come in. Um, we want to be able to take a network like this and predict the behavior of this. And we do mathematics and computational simulations of these networks to, to see how these networks will behave. We uh, computationally model these systems, but we do this in the context of the experimental system. So we're always going back and forth between experiment and, um, and mathematical or computational model. So this is an iterative process. Um, I don't have the slide here, but one of my favorite um, quotes I like to use is, uh, it was Picasso who said, art is, um, is a lie that reveals the truth. Mathematical modeling is a lie that reveals the truth about biology. There's no way there's any mathematical model that's actually accurate in terms of the molecular interactions, but it helps us to define the problem, it helps us to define the experiments to do, and it helps us to extract that biological insight. So, why can we do this now? Um, 
Traditionally, we think about biology, um, this is the central dogma of biology, DNA makes RNA makes protein. And traditionally we would study one piece of DNA or one gene, maybe we'd study the RNA, most often we would not, but we'd, have, we'd study the protein product of that gene. And we'd interrogate it, we'd take it apart, and we, in a reductionist way, we'd, uh, we'd study that protein in very high detail. But the advent of high throughput genome sequencing, um, subsequent high throughput transcriptomics where we can read all the RNA in a single cell, and uh, increasingly the ability to read and quantify all the proteins within a cell allows us to not take a one gene, one protein, one career kind of approach to science, but a very holistic view of science. And that, of course, this is way too much for my brain, way too much for most people's brains, and so we require computation to integrate this sort of analysis. And that's what we call systems biology. It's just that process. I've told, I've told you this is called genomics, this is called transcriptomics, this is called proteomics. This is part of the central dogma, but you'll, you might also hear things like lipidomics, the study of all the lipids, metabolomics, the study of all the metabolome, phenomics, which is study of all the phenotypes that are possible in a system, epigenomics, all the epigenetic changes that happen in a chromosome, and so on and so on. So this omics has sort of been uh, stolen by lots of different uh, acronyms as well. So another illustrative example is of course Galileo observed the movement of the star of the planets um, but it was only an observation it was it was Kepler who allowed us to who drew the mathematical equations and allowed it to make uh, turn th those observations of Galileo into a prediction. And that's precisely what we try to do in biology now, in systems biology, is be able to predict um, where we will be with a new perturbation. So this requires um, a cycle we call uh, a virtuous cycle or, uh, of biology now, systems biology, where a question in biology always leads to a sort of a stumbling block in technology, ultimately. So we develop new technologies in proteomics and genomics and so on. Um, that leads to new challenges in computation. So around and around this cycle we go to gain new biological insight that would not be possible without this cycle. And that, of course, requires cross-disciplinary culture, team science. Here we have physicists, we have mathematicians, we have uh, uh, biologists, the cell biologists like myself, biochemists, uh, technologists, and so on. Um, we tend to use model systems like yeast to help drive technology, drive this cycle. And as soon as we can, we try to uh, adopt these technologies and insights to uh, the human system. And I'll give you a couple of examples of this. So in my lab, um, for depressingly about 12 years, um, I've had people in my lab take yeast cells and drop them into olive oil. And when they drop them into olive oil, all hell breaks loose in the cells. Um, so olive oil is used as an alternative carbon source to um, glucose. And so a yeast cell loves to grow on glucose, but when you drop them in oleic, or oleic acid, which is the major component of olive oil, you drop it in oleic acid, it has to change everything. It has to change the way it metabolizes everything. And it builds these new organelles down here called the peroxisome, and the peroxisomes are responsible for the beta oxidation of the fatty acid. So what happens is about 40% of the genes change in their transcription. The metabolic networks are reorganized, new organelles are built, some modules are shut down. And this is really a program, of the, there's a programmed response the cells undergo. And we, we've studied this at the level of proteomics, genomics, network analysis, network modeling, prediction and testing. And we've done this for about 12 to 14 years now. 
And we've got some really interesting insights into signaling networks, the dynamics of, the, of changes in the nucleus, which is the, encapsulates all the chromatin, transcriptional network, and all these complex con and coordinate control mechanisms. But I don't really care about a yeast cell growing on oleic acid at all. This is a model. It's only a model for us to, to develop these tools and approaches. But if you think about this, when a pathogen infects a cell, all the same things happen. About 50% of the genes change in expression when vaccinia virus infects a cell. You've got all of these large signaling networks, transcriptional networks, and instead of building a new organelle, you build a new virus. The cell explodes, viruses are, and the viruses uh, pop out. So we're beginning to apply the tools and approaches we used in yeast to understanding pathogens and path host, uh, pathogen host interactions. Context of viruses, context of malaria, trypanosomes, and, uh, and other protozoan parasites. And the reason for this, of course, is that the HIV, we may think that HIV is cured, but it truly is very, very far from cured. Kills about 1.6 million people a year still, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, about a third of the world is infected with TB. I'll just let that sit in. A third of the world is infected with TB. It's amazing to me. It kills a person every 20 seconds. With TB, um, people are infected, but the, but the bug remains latent. It just sits there in the, in the lungs and, and uh, doesn't really have much of an effect until for some what, whatever reason, maybe it's immunosuppression, maybe there's some other um, inherent activity in the bug, it activates, then the person gets sick, coughs, spews, spits it out, the next person gets ill, and then it becomes latent again. And that's why there's so many people infected. And malaria um, threatens about 40% of the world. It kills someone about every 38 seconds, about a million people per year. <clears throat> For each of these diseases, there are no vaccines, and where there are drugs, Drug resistance is popping up. Drug resistance is popping up in malaria in Southeast Asia. Uh, TB, there's lots of drug resistance, primarily in, uh, again, in Asia, but also in, in, uh, in India. Um, we have no vaccines, and the fundamental reason we have no vaccines is because um, the practice of making a vaccine has not fundamentally changed since the days of Edward Jenner. Basically, what we do with a vaccine is we take a bug, we attenuate it, and we inject it into somebody and hope that that person will mount an immune response. And when the person mounts an immune response and then is infected with the real live virus or uh, pathogen, whatever it is, then they will have a, have a memory response already incorporated, and they'll be able to take care of that bug. These guys have got mechanisms to evade our immune system. And so what we need to do is to use systems approaches to figure out how they do that and then try to be a little smarter than nature. Um, and here's an example of, wh of why this is so important. So many of you may have heard about the Merck trial or STEP vaccine trial. It happened a few years ago. And basically here, um, there was a piece of the, of the uh, HIV virus that was inserted into a plasmid, and, it was, and that was incorporated into a cold virus, adenovirus. And this was used as an antigen, as a vaccine. And so folks got this vaccine, and hopefully they uh, began to make some of that uh, antigen from the virus, express it on the surface of their cells, and then they would uh, create antibodies against that, and then upon infection with HIV, they'd already have antibodies, and it would attack that, uh, attack the virus. That's the concept in, in very broad strokes. These are the results. So on the bottom is time. So the time to event. Event in this case is getting an HIV infection, okay? In blue is a placebo. 
in red are those people that were vaccine, vaccinated. Clearly, it didn't work. Look at this number, 90, day, 90 weeks. So it took 90 weeks, almost two years, before this trial was stopped. Think of all the people that were infected with HIV as a result of this failure, the cost. Over here is where it gets a little worry, more worrisome. These vaccinees recently had a cold. They had antibodies floating in their system, in their blood, to adenovirus. In this case, the vaccinees did far worse than the, than the placebo. So, and we just don't know what the hell's going on. So we need to take a systems approach to start to dissect this and try to understand what it is that uh, these patients who recently had a cold and these patients who did not, let alone why the vaccine didn't work in the first place. So this is a network view of cells circulating um, in, the, uh, in the blood. Um, each one of these nodes represents a protein in a signaling network. Red means the gene expression went up. Green me means the gene expression went down upon vaccination. Each one of these lines is an edge. It connects these, these proteins as a, in the network view I showed you before. So if you focus in now, on the left-hand side, this is a key element of the innate immune signaling response. These guys are interferon responsive genes, IRF5, IRF7, and IRF1. And vaccines, vaccinees without adenovirus activate their interferon response, which is good. There's a very small portion of that network. On the right-hand side, unfortunately, these are the vaccinees without or with adenovirus. This guy is green key central node. This is Chicago. And Chicago didn't respond, and as a result, the interferon response failed. This is why these patients didn't do well with vac vaccination. And so what we're trying to do is use that kind of information to be able to identify signatures that would be predictive of vaccine immunogenicity. So rather than after 90 days, an X number of people getting, uh, contracting HIV, we can identify those signatures early in a response. Perhaps this network we could have seen at two weeks as opposed to um, 90 days or 90 weeks. Understand those molecular networks that lead to a predictive response and then ultimately re-engineer that response with a predictable outcome. That's our goal. So that's sort of a rather proximal goal. That's sort of a short-term kind of thing that we want to do. But on a larger scale, what we, if you think about this a little further, what systems biology enables is a much broader vision for all of biology, for all of human health and human wellness. And that is we can predict we can use, perhaps use DNA sequences, regular multi-parameter blood measurements on you and me, not worrying about HIV infection, but perhaps worrying about diabetes or cancer. We can personalize treatment to think about, um, to incorporate the, hu the individual genetic elements that, that are, are peculiar to each one of us. We can predict or prevent, um, design therapeutics that are preventive, Drugs, vaccines, of course, but also things that might uh, preempt Alzheimer's disease. And we can be participatory because, of course, social networks and information, we're all a much more educated populace and uh, individuals will participate in their, whole, in their own health care. So this is the concept of P4 medicine. And this is really the brainchild of, of Lee Hood. So dig a little deeper into this. So what does this mean? Systems genetics. Systems genetics is the same concept as, of, as Chicago and, um, and uh, Denver being two key elements in a network. But 
we're not thinking about the proteins themselves now, we're just thinking about sort of the emergent property of the interactions among those genes. So this concept of systems genetics is really a, a very difficult concept for us to, to uh, deal with. Um, but, but genome sequencing and analysis will allow us to begin to understand the network of interacting genes that lead to these different phenotypes people have. These networks, like the one I showed you with, uh, with the Merck trial, these are, um, allow early detection. They're fingerprints. They're fingerprints for, um, for disease, uh, uh, disease status. They allow disease stratification so we can determine the stage of disease. They allow us to detect disease early um, in, in, uh, in vaccine immunogenicity and protection. I've, I've shown you this, but also in terms of Alzheimer's disease or cancers and so on. We can measure how someone is responding to disease. We can do clinical trials much more effectively and so on. Ultimately, network control. We want to be able to map and understand the dynamics of these regulatory networks and control them through uh, perturbations, through drugs. And then this emerges from this is this concept of synthetic biology. Synthetic biology is gene, uh, genetic engineering on steroids. Thinking about the whole network and trying to uh, make predictions. Chemical genomics, which is uh, Really, it's a, an accelerated version of the pharmaceutical uh, drug discovery, and, um, and so on. And so P4 medicine, as a result that spins out of this concept of systems biology, has got profound implications for all of human health. I've mentioned some of these things, but it allows us to focus on wellness as opposed to reacting to disease allows us to do early detection, stratify disease, personalize treatment, monitor disease progression and therapy, um, and assess re reoccurrences. That, my phone? Anyone important? No. Okay. <laughs> um, but it will be a disruptive technology. It'll be disruptive in pharmaceuticals, in biotech, diagnostics and devices, in IT for healthcare, in education, in medical schools, and so on. So, not only is that is human health uh, obvious, but global health, infectious disease, animal health, the environment, energy, nutrition, agriculture, and so on. So, it has a potential to fundamentally change the way all biological research is done. So, let me give you a little bit of reality check. So there's a challenge. Data space is infinite. So if I think about my yeast cell dropping him, him in oleic acid, that's one of an infinite number of things I could have done to the yeast cell. So we have to think very carefully about how we formulate these perturbations and do these experiments and search the relevant data space. Um, there's a hu huge dimensionality of data. Signal to noise is a big challenge. Of those 40% of the genes that change when I drop yeast cells into oleic acid, how many are important? 10%? 2%? 40%? I don't know. So we need to reduce this high dimensional dimensionality of data to simple hypotheses about biology and get to the root causes. Um, there are global measurements of many different data types. So lipidomics, phenomics, all of those things, metabolomics. Um, we have to assess the quality of all of those data. We have to uh, assess signal to noise uh, as well and, and address those challenges. We have to integrate multiple different levels of a hierarchy. So genes to proteins to RNA, but then to cells, to interactions of cells, to make organs, interactions among organs, communications among organs so on and so on and so on. And then finally, you can get all of this data, but really dealing with the granularity of biological information. What is the relevant point here? We could be completely swamped in all the data. And this is why it's so critical 
to incorporate computation so, and to tie computation to experiment. So we can do this in a very effective way. Computation alone will lead to thousands and thousands and thousands of hypotheses, all of which, 99% of which will be wrong or irrelevant. Um, we have lots of technical challenges in genomics, in proteomics, in imaging, single cell analysis, and, and um, I, really, I don't really need to go through all this. Just to say that um, we have a lot of work ahead of us. And then there's the challenge of culture. There's how do we, as a group of scientists who are all motivated by egos, begin to work together? When we started the ISB, <laughs> it's actually kind of funny, we had physicists and we brought in, um, we brought in physicists and biologists and we'd sit them together. And a physicist had this sense that Biology is a soft science, and that the hard science is physics. This is the key. And so they really thought of the biologists as really sort of experimentalists, technicians. But they, they were the bright ones. On the other hand, the biologists thought of these physicists as keyboard jockeys. Really didn't understand biology. No real inherent knowledge. And so, and that was actually caused quite, quite a lot of turmoil at ISB for the, at the beginning because you know, trying to get these people to sit together, to think together, to bring their different skill sets to one another, and yet, yet their own insecurities led them to this fundamental impasse. And so over time, they began to realize what the other brought to the game. And so it's this whole concept of enlightened self-interest. And so if we can get folks to, to realize, so if you walk into a room and you have a meeting and you walk into a room and you're, the, and you're the leader of this meeting and you're the smartest person in that room, you got the wrong team. Absolutely the wrong team. And so we need to be able to convey that to people. And scientists don't think that, well, that way. Um, so we have to develop that culture, foster cross-disciplinary collaboration. We have to be able to recognize um, contributions people make. And we have to develop partnerships internally and externally. Uh, lots of scientific challenges, I've told you that. The education challenges are, are immense, and these are for you to solve. But, um, but certainly, we understand that there are big challenges in education. And for kids to, start, to stop thinking about their individual silos. So why I asked you earlier whether you were trying to, wanted to raise or teach physicists phys, or, or teach people to be intelligent citizens. And I think we need to do a lot of uh, intelligent citizenry. Um, and of course, P4. Uh, societal implications of P4 are huge. Legal, ethical, and so on and so on. And that is where I will stop. <laughs>